Okay, as a reminder, this um, presentation is being recorded and will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel, Artivism for Shared Humanity. Welcome everyone to Artivism, the Power of Art for Social Transformation. Um, today we have with us Karen Viola, who works and resides on ancestral lands of the Muncie Lenape in White Plains, New York. Her extensive experience designing innovative children's books and her love of nature informs her interdisciplinary art practice. Her art often gravitates to the book form using found materials, offering Viscaro hands-on learning experiences that strive to nurture curiosity, echo literacy, and social connections. Um, welcome, Viola. Car Karen, sorry, <laughs> Viola. A lot of people do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here and um, appreciate this opportunity to share my artivism journey, um, which is still very much an unfolding process. So um, in preparation for this presentation, um, I made a bunch of slides and it was a really interesting um, exercise. I decided to reflect back on what my most pivotal past influences have been through the lens of what my graduate studies are focused on, which is eco-literacy and how to cultivate it in myself and others through my art. So these slides will hopefully tell the story and I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully this will work fine. Okay, so everyone can see, I think. Okay, so um, yeah, so as someone who likes to write, design, sketch, paint, photograph, make books and other stuff by hand and lately out of plastic trash and natural dyeing, I, I've done a whole bunch of things. I'm, I, I like to experiment and I often feel all over the place, honestly, but um, I do see like from reflecting at, you know, on, on how I came to the place I am now, that there's two common themes, a desire to understand big pictures and stuff them into nutshells, usually in the book form, and the need to physically and intimately engage with the natural world. So um, I will proceed. And this is just um, just kind of like a backstory. Um, it, it's there are certain things in my past that really influenced me. Um, a diet for a small planet when I was a teenager. I you know kind of tried to be a vegetarian. I've gone in and out of that, um, but it really sort of opened my eyes to a lot of things. Um, Vincent Van Gogh when I went to art school. I named my car after Vincent. Um, I so he's his work and his letters are really inform my my work. And um, yeah, I got into children's publishing and was busy with that and my family for a couple of decades. And um, an inconvenient truth in 2006 was hugely influential, and I really tried to to um, see how I could change the work that I do in my job. And um, it, it, it's hard, it's, it's not easy being green, as I say here, um, but I like to camp and climb and, and I am a backpacker. So yeah, just a couple more slides of how I came to where I am now. Um, I raise funds for Hike for Mental Health by selling on Etsy my um, cards that I do every year. And 2016 was really pivotal um, because it was when the company I was working for um, was kind of sold off and I had to make a decision. Do I wanna keep going in the corporate world or do I wanna you know, go, at, go it on my own as an artist and a freelancer? And I chose the latter and um, the election kind of threw me and I realized there was a lot I didn't understand. Um, so I took a course at the new school and learned a lot and decided to make a book about what I learned. And, and then I discovered book art as this form of art that where I could, all the things that I like to do, I could sort of put into one package. So that really changed, changed my direction hugely. Um, and another 
extremely influential um, work of art is uh, Chris Jordan's film, uh, Albatross. I know we've all seen images now of the plastic in, in sea creatures and how they choke on it and feed it to their young. Um, it's something we all kind of know. This is mainstream news now, but at the time, this this I really didn't realize just how bad it it was, and it was, and it wasn't just a doc. It, this is not just a documentary. This is an absolutely beautiful, gorgeous film. I recommend it highly, and it it made me decide to really look at what I was doing in in my personal life and and how I was buying things and and just I noticed plastic everywhere all of a sudden so I I started saving my my plastic and deciding to make things out of it and I so I constructed this albatross book um that has the uh the poem the rhyme of the ancient mariner <laughs> um on tiny little pages in there and I, my freelance work doing middle school um history books also informs my work because again I learned just how little I learned as a child um, it was a whitewashed history and you know that we've all come to uh, reckon with uh, missing a lot of important information 2020 obviously was a major year um, a lot going on I, I making books was really um, helpful to me uh, psychologically. And I decided I loved researching on my own so much that I was going to go to graduate school. So I'm doing that online and I am focusing on eco-literacy. So eco-literacy, the word. It was coined in the 1990s by physicist Fritjof Capra based on educator David Orr's concept of eco ecological literacy. I get a little hard to pronounce there. Ecoliteracy is a nice kind of like artivism, it's one word. So as you all know, ecology is the study of ecosystems, how living things interact with their habitat. And literacy means more than reading and writing, it means communicating and engaging with others in meaningful ways. So I, on the right, I, I do like to sketch a lot um, on site when I'm hiking, um, so, and trees and roots, I love that. So what does eco-literacy mean? It means, I'm gonna have some bullet points here that, that capture what it means. Understanding how nature sustains life and acting on this knowledge in our own lives. Knowing our place in the interconnected web of life. Having a sense of place and intimacy with the land knowing how to nurture a sustainable lifestyle based on knowing how nature sustains life. And indigenous wisdom is, is an important component. Um, so this piece here in the images, um, I my work with children's publishing and um, novelty books really um, help all that experience uh, definitely informs my art, um, paper engineering. So this was uh, called Mountain Spirit honoring the Shoshone peoples of the Mountain West um, and alluding to the melting glaciers also. The book is packaged in um, a replica of, uh, it's called a parfleche, which the uh, Native Americans used to, to use um, to when they were traveling. And eco-literacy means understanding cause and effect in the natural and cultural systems of our lives. And critical thinking about social and environmental justice and what actions nurture community well-being. So it's really, it really is a big word. It's a, and, and it means it's, it's sort of very focused on systems thinking um, and how everything just connects with one, one thread of the fabric. If there's something that's not working, just like in nature, um, in society, then things fall apart um, or collapse. So this work here, um, I, the workshop that I took um, with natural dyeing, which was on a previous slide, it it, it spilled into my book work. Um, it's it's indigo, um, and this book. Um, there'll be some more images coming up. 
But I really dove into understanding the uh, Atlantic slave trade just so I, I could really, really deeply feel informed about what led to what led to what to the situation we are at now, which is still terrible. Um, so here are just some more images. Um, it's a timeline um, and they're like pockets, cloth pockets, and you can take out the cards that have what happened in that 50 year period. And the, the red line is like a painted acrylic line on top of the indigo that um, conveys how many captive Africans were embarked on the ships. And you can see the forming of our country. It gets really intense there. So it was certainly an interesting project to work on. And again, it made it really doing that kind of work made me realize that I wanted to keep going um, in a formal way. So I uh, signed up for graduate school. So what are the barriers to eco-literacy? Western modern ideology myths that humans are separate from nature, that success means economic growth, that there are no limits to economic growth. These are all myths. Uh, another barrier, overconsumption and throwing away because there is no away. The hidden costs of global supply chains, uh, globalization. There's a huge gap between what we do in our daily lives and how those things that we use in our daily lives are made and the extraction um, that is necessary. And we just have no concept of it because it's hidden. Media distractions and misinformation, inaccessible education and healthcare. So um, the, the image on the right is, um, I, I did that in response to Trump's wall. Um, it's a little hard to tell, but it's this kind of large book that is made out of galvanized steel and there's wood mixed media edges where if you look at a certain angle, you can see endangered species. Um, the perils of ecological illiteracy. Um, well, basically the world we're in, um, the, there's a lot of beauty in this world, but there's a lot of um, serious um, issues. You, you probably all know this, mass extinction, climate change, et cetera. Basically, the less we understand the systems that provide our basic needs, the re less resilient we will be to the devastating effects of their collapse. The more fragile and fractured our country is, the more violence we will continue to face. This was in response to the January 6th violence. Um, it's uh, cut out by hand. Um, on one side are the words of Martin Luther King. On the opposite side is the, uh, the downloadable impeachment of um, Donald Trump. Yeah, who was, the, who was the real king of the castle there? Um, and, and this was in response to the massive um, shootings that are just so so horrif horrific and and I just I had to respond and I I'm planning to edition this book to just to 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 get it out there. Um, it's it's based on it's it's just a small little book, but it has a bullet hole in it that gets bigger and bigger. And there is um, magnets like magnetic poetry, which allow you to play around with the words of the second amendment. Um, and I, I, I kind of did my own version there. So, so what do I mean by regenerating? To regenerate means to reform or regrow what has been injured or lost. Indigenous cultures didn't need the word eco-literacy. They embodied its meaning in order to survive and sustain themselves for millennia. And then the other, the other thing about re regenerating, um, again, I was inspired by that albatross film. So I call it regeneration, my whole plastic um, art. <laughs> it's um, a process of regenerating waste, turning it into something new, to raise awareness of our unsustainable lifestyles. So this um, sea star, which I see, I need to fix the spelling of that, but hey, it could be that, that the title could be C that way. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's all found plastic um, packaging and I use an iron and parchment paper and make yarn out of um, 
plastic bags and stitch it together and sometimes poke my finger. Um, and, you know, like what's, what's interesting about um, the, these creatures is it's not just that they're these cool, cool creatures that um, are endangered. It, again, it's, it's a whole web of life thing. Um, so the warming, global warming is affecting, um, like making them die off. They, they have this, it's called um, wasting disease, sea star wasting disease, and it's, it's being exacerbated by the warm water. And what, why it matters is because these creatures eat urchins, which eat kelp. And now the urchins have taken over, which has caused the entire kelp forest habitats to be lost, um, up to 90% in California, apparently, which affects whales, seals, birds, and certain fish on which some people's livelihoods depend. Again, just stressing that um, one thing affects another. How can we regenerate ecoliteracy? So I have a few simple statements. Um, that, that um, anyone can do. Cultivate biophilia, which means the love of life or living things. Go outside, find a park, follow streams, teach a child how to hug a tree. And that little, little girl there is my granddaughter. <laughs> so I'm teaching her. And uh, take the time to read the book of nature, noticing sights, sounds, and smells. The image here is a book that I made that um, is called Old Stump. It's a poem um, that I, it's, it's a unique piece, it's one of a kind, and it's, it unrolls, it's like a scroll. So, and it has embedded twist ties. Um, it's all like, it, it's random papers that I had in my closet and paint, a little bit of paint. And um, so you can unroll it and it has a mixed media kind of collage on the inside and the poem is on the outside and it looks like a stump. So it's kind of a fun piece. Um, and learn about the importance of pollinators and biodiversity. So this image um, was my latest card that I do every year that I, um, uh, addition to sell for hike for mental health. And there are 19 hidden animals in this image, including the two humans and the swan, which are easy to see. But in the negative spaces, you can kind of see there's birds and butterflies and, and a turtle and a deer. And it, it, it was a lot of fun to, to do this piece. Um, and people had fun with that. Honor cultural diversity and common causes and find common causes and build community. So yeah, I have had the pleasure of doing larger works where I do work with the community. I did this mural, I designed it and I kind of outlined it. Um, it was sort of a fundraiser, awareness and fundraiser for Cristosal, which is an organization, an NGO down in El Salvador. They do a lot of amazing work um, to help uh, with the, the violence and the underserved um, families and youths down there to try to, 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 try to advocate for them um, and their legal rights, um, hopefully to stem the tide of, of them wanting to leave the country and come here. Um, so they do a lot of good work. And this was really great. People really got involved. And uh, again, I did paint by numbers. Um, and then I kind of touched up in the middle of the night. <laughs> it was a lot of work, but a lot of fun. And so I have the honor of um, having received a, a generous grant from Arts Westchester this year. Um, so I am going to be doing a very large fish. It's, a, it's gonna be like a school of fish. It's gonna be called Treasure School. And there's a little paper model of it. It's, it's just a kind of a rough model. It's gonna be 14 feet uh, wide. Um, it will look like kind of the, the silhouette of a sturgeon and it's gonna have endangered species fish in the Hudson River. So it's, it's all about the Hudson. I'm partnering with Riverkeeper um, and um, 
so I, I'm also integrating um, and presenting uh, to the entire third grade of uh, elementary school in Tarrytown and having the, the children each do a little fish that will be included in, in this piece. Um, what what the river means to them, and so they'll feel a part of it. So it's all about community and and raising awareness about the biodiversity. And then one one thing, you know, a really great thing that everyone can do is, and some people may know this already, but a lot of people don't, is to really get to know your water. It's the most basic, precious thing that we have in our lives that we we need and a lot of people don't know where it comes from. You know, they think, especially kids, they, they just sort of turn on the tap and assume that, well, the water, they just don't, it, it, like, there's no need to think about where it is coming from because we're just busy with our lives and, and we turn on the water and there it is. But to understand that everyone lives on a watershed is really important um, because it, they, they, it gets polluted. Anything that falls on the, on the, the ground, the the runoff of um, uh, farms and fertilizer that people use and pol pollution from industry, it goes right into the water and it makes it harder to, to filter and treat the water. So again, I, I'm doing a lot of research on this because I'm learning myself, um, but it's, it's just really interesting to understand what watershed that you belong to. And um, I, I don't know, you, you guys, um, if, at, I know at Delphi, the, one of the main campuses is on Long Island, which is interesting because it's ground aquifers. Um, it's it's not what is typical of the rest of the state, which is from lakes, rivers, and streams. And then New York City and Westchester, where I live, we get our water from um, the uh, reservoirs in the mountains of Catskill and Delaware watershed. So that's just start with water. Where does the water come from? Understand it, um, and that's a great place to to start for becoming more eco-literate and learn the stories of the living worlds under the surface. So I, this is my latest piece of uh, book art that is called Nursery, the River That Flows Both Ways. And it, it was again, research-based. Um, I kind of dove into the history um, way before 1609, before um, Henry Hudson sailed up the the river trying to get trying to get to where he was thinking he would go um a lot of revolution i mean there's so much history that we do know but um the lenape had an amazing um life that is in the archaeological record um and they sustained it um by having a re reciprocity with the land and so that some of that is in my kind of poetic prose, and in, and I, I actually go back to the geological story of how the glaciers uh, formed the, the Hudson River. So that's and 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 it's cut in a way that kind of has a feel of of a river. So that's that. Oops, oh my. And yeah, so this was Saturday, just the other day. Um, part of my project was to collect trash and from the river this is in Sleepy Hollow and I will be using some of the the plastic pieces um, in my project coming up and remember humans are part of not apart from nature and like ripples in a pond one small change makes a big difference and this is a piece made entirely out of plastic you can sort of see the New York Times blue plastic bag <laughs> there bubble wrap and that's it. And here are just some resources that really inspired me. And that is all. And I will stop sharing. Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, this was so amazing. <laughs> I, um, I don't know where to start, but let, let, let's get to the logistics of things and then we'll go into our conversation. Um, so thank you, Karen, for being our artivist for today. Um, this presentation so incredibly concludes Artivism Spring 2023 season.
Uh, but please stay tuned for Artivism's Wearable Art for a Purpose exhibition, which is now um, up at and open at Adelphi University's Performing Arts Center in their garden at their Garden City campus. Um, the opening reception for this will be this Thursday, May 11th at 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. This exhibition will then travel to the Ofit Gallery, Teatro Yerba Brujas Gallery, and the Center for Women of New York. Um, before we get to the discussion, we want to invite um, Sarah Avery. Thank you for having me. Um, I was part of a panel of three people. And we, I will introduce them both right now, Lori Joning and Patty Wrighthoff. I don't know if either of them are here. I don't see them here today, but that that's okay. They were a very integral part. We all voted equally. Um, just a little caveat. We didn't know who the people were. We just saw the proposals. We also were not aware of their affiliations at the time. Um, we were very honored to take on this decision. It's for the fall 2022 award. And so how we did it is we each got a copy of the proposals. We went over them individually and did a ranking on an email chain. And then we were able to meet all together and discuss our rationale, pros, cons. There were a lot of different um, viewpoints on it, you know, personal preferences, institutional preferences, feasibility. Um, but ultimately, I think everyone was happy with the choice that we came to. I think we wish that we could give every candidate something because they were all amazing initiatives and so this year there'll be two different artivists that are going to receive some funding and it will be split and not in any particular order just how it's written on my paper between Micah Ozele and Monica Meyer so I believe both of them are here today if they'd like to say something about their projects if not I can introduce them Go ahead, Micah. I can see you turned your camera on. Okay. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. And sorry, I couldn't be here earlier. Um, I just was hoping to catch the rest of the presentation too. Um, you want me to tell you a little bit about the project maybe? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, okay, great. So I, uh, I'm an apartment here in Brazil, but I also play guitar <laughs> and uh, I play seven string um, classical guitar and I play Brazilian music on the weekends. And like one of my passions and one of the things I've been trying to figure out is how to like marry together what I do with <clears throat> music on the weekends with the research I do about activists in Brazil a hundred years ago. So I put together this idea of a project <clears throat> um, to work with an activist um, of color in the 1930s that was an amazing musician and he played tenor sax. And uh, I wanna try and bring some of his ideas and his melodies and do an archival research trip that tells more about his work, but then be able to also play, you know, when I give talks around universities, be able to play that work with the guitar. So I also will use the funds to uh, do a week long summer intensive um, in Connecticut this summer with a musicologist from Brazil that's coming up to do some teaching. So that'll help me kind of get the, the ball rolling on everything. So thank you so much. Congratulations. And Sarah, you'll introduce uh, Miss. I believe she's here, but I can give a little bit of background. Um... I know on our own campus, we acknowledge her project because we also do the clothesline project, which is based off of her original El Tendedero. And um, I believe we were impressed not only by the work that she's been doing for so many years, but that she continues to do and that the pieces are not sold to the museums. They're, they're for the public. And we were very proud to be able to help her continue this work. I believe it says here that she's been doing it for about 45 years. For, for those of you that don't know, um, the clothesline or El Tendedero has to do with um, violence against women and also um, in now about um, violence against non-binary people. And there are workshops given by Monica. And I don't know if she wants to continue on or...
No, you please, you, you continue. You're explaining it very well. And I'm so surprised that I don't even know what to say. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, so the closed line project is an international project. And for that reason, we were honored to be able to continue to give to it. Um, I believe here it also said that some of the work will be um, translating the website as of right now. I believe it is in Spanish. So that would help reach a wider audience. And um, these are our two choices for this year. Well, for fall. I know there's another round for spring. Congratulations. Yes, congratulations to both of you. So happy. And we are so proud to have you looped back into Clothesline, Ms. Mayor. Can't wait to hear from both of you about your research. Thank you Thank so you. much. Look, look forward. Hopefully we can get invited back to do a, a, a part two. Oh, with, that with for sure. Next year. Yes. <laughs> Carolina, would you like to say something? I would like to thank um, the committee, uh, Sarah Avery, for being the, the presenter today of the award and for taking the time to look through all the proposals that went into this election for the full um, group of artists. Uh, thank you for being so conscious about how this uh, grant from Sing for Hope was going to be delivered and to the projects having a vision that matches up with that of artivism, Sing for Hope, and other for University of Government Libraries, you know, all of our sponsors. Um, perhaps if we if we like to open now the floor for the audience and start the conversation with Ms. Viola in her amazing presentation. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to you before perhaps I make my suggestions or comments. <laughs> Well, um, Karen, I want to know where can we see these books? <laughs> well, um, let's see. I have some on my bookshelf here. <laughs> um, I have, I do have an Etsy shop with um, a couple of pieces. Um, I've exhibited in in um, in in galleries, um, and yeah. Um, let's see. I there's a couple of well over in Seattle at the uh, the museum out there and in down in Emory um, I, I, I um, donated um, one of my slave ship books to their library but it's it's a challenge book art is is a challenge because it's it's a form of art that really is is meant to be very intimate and you know held in your held in in your hands so that you can viscerally you know really turn the pages and feel it and and I, I I walk a line between doing something that's too too complex to be able to do too many copies um you know I I try to I I'm I'm figuring out ways to simplify the engineering so that I can addition it and um I, I I am sort of in the process of doing that. It's like hard, you know, I'm in graduate school, so like there's no time to to do that. But but yeah, you know, it's 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 labors of love. And I certainly would like to share my my work with with people. And 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 you know, I, I wanted it to be accessible. I, I'm I'm that's very important to me because sometimes art, whether it's sculpture, paintings, or or book art, is is just very costly you know for people and so I, I that's why I'm really excited about this grant because it's going to be one big huge thing that that can be seen by um, people like it's going to swim around to different river towns and I'll show it off and maybe you know make make small make my little um, river book and get some money to make an addition of that and and go to like sell locally you know go to craft fairs and and sell that way so they're very beautiful with such powerful messages mm -hmm. um I, I was just amazed at, at at how um different they all are mm -hmm. uh the the, mm -hmm. the the range of media you work in i almost want to play with plastic and an ironing an yeah. iron <laughs> Yeah, like, i want to set fire to my house it's, <laughs> um, an, it's an interesting medium for sure it's 
you know, it's, it's kind of a weird thing. I, I'm getting, it, it's hard. There's a lot of plastic all over the place in my house. So it's, uh, I have to keep it organized and we'll see. Yeah. Maybe you could do a workshop for us at Artivism <laughs> on how to create these works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Let me see. I would like to jump in now. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, first, I'd like to thank you, Ms. Viola, for giving us this uh, superb presentation, uh, both uh, audio and visually. Mm -hmm. uh, in incredible works. Uh, what a creativity, you know. Um, as I was looking at, at your books, uh, what came to mind is uh, the power of art to transcend the word as well, right? Because mm -hmm. sometimes you hear about what we're doing to our earth. Perhaps you might see also images from the fires, the floods, but through art and, for example, the, your books, how, is, how are the audience reacting, right, in regards to changing how you so nicely put equilibrium, right? How is that? Have, have you seen the transformation of the audience that comes across your work in regards to their part of maintaining the the balance between all of the forces uh, that make this planet our home. Yeah, well, right. That that's that's the biggest challenge that you know you hope that to that to to kind of from th that gap between being inspired and then taking action. Um, I just I think you know it's it's small steps, but I think somebody who who can touch and feel something that has some information that might make you think like even something as simple as as uh, as a, the story of your place like something historical about a river that you just take for granted that that hopefully will just stay in somebody's mind if if they're inspired by the visuals and and encountering it and it's it's like small steps hopefully um i i mean i'm hoping that I think reaching young people is really key. It honestly is. And engaging them in making art too. So I am interested in trying to like run workshops where um, kids are engaged and either helping collaborate on on some work or maybe, you know, adding adding their their piece. Cause I, I just think you have to embody the the information and in, in order for it to kind of have an impact um, but that's part of what I'm studying is how to how to actually inspire people through art to actually change their their behavior I mean that that is what we that is what I want to do and it's it's not you know not an easy thing it's hard with with everything going on and it's it's easy to get numb and just not it's too, it's too big too hard too complicated but and I also was curious about your uh, international collaborations, like, for example, the one in El Salvador and what you mentioned about inspiring them to stay there rather than to yeah. jump on the craze of migration. Would you spend perhaps a little bit about that? Work yeah, that yeah. Um, well, it, through my my church in Terrytown, um, they um, there there's actually um, Abbott House is um, a place that has been um, a sanctuary basically for refugees and, and asylum seekers, um, teenagers mostly. And so there's been a connection to helping them on this end, like that they're here. But this this organization, Cristo Sal, like I said, they they're trying to like they're trying to help. Um, it's mostly legal work, but also providing safe houses and and just you know trying to um, to make it known what rights people really do have. Um, it's a real it's it's even more it's it's a really difficult situation down there as we know. It's just it's the violence is 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 incredible with the gangs and everything. And so I mean. A lot of people don't necessarily know the the backstory of of that, um, and it's 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 really hard to 
to try to explain what Christosol does when it's usually it's like legal work. It's not, you know, something that you can grasp, but the bridge of hope, the um, the colors in in honoring the style, the folk style of of the art down there in Central Central America, was really important in in this mural, which was done a few years back. It was twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen, um, but it it had a big. It, it really did help people at least become more aware of what what was going on and 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 what what the organization is trying to do and yeah so so that was that was a, the, it's 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 just so so important to, like i said is to you can read you can read about something but then if you have some kind of activity where you're using other senses it helps that information become more retained i think in your heart and, and in your mind Any other comments? Hi, this is Liz Dinda. Um, I just wanted to make a comment as well. Um, you know, I, I think it's really important um, what Karen is doing because through her art, she is um, doing beautiful works of art, but also like, you know, teaching a lesson. And I feel like it would really, it really speaks to, to everyone, whether you're a child or a middle schooler or a teenager or an adult, like it, it crosses the ocean to speak to everyone, you know? And um, I mean, I would love for Karen to do a workshop for the plastic <laughs> as well. <laughs> Thanks Liz. <laughs> and the dyeing is too, you know, the dyeing of the materials. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would yeah. love, you know, I think children also need to see these things as well. And like, Mm -hmm. presentations at school like in elementary school like you have to start when they're little yeah um, I agree. so that you know they they can have that appreciation you know because everything now is so technology based mm -hmm. yeah. and um, we really need to get back to nature yeah it's it's true I mean you know there's ways of 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 using the technology like one thing I'll say is the Merlin app where you can ID the sound of like you can record a bird song and you know the name of the bird. It's really addictive. It's and it's that's a great use of technology. But but yeah, connecting it so that you are then going outside and oh, I know that bird because you know I've learned what that bird is. And I I agree with you, Liz. It has to, we have to um, connect kids with. I mean, supplement what they're learning in school. I mean, especially after COVID, like the third grade class, I mean, I'm going to have to keep things like really, really simple because they've lost a year from the pandemic at least. And, and they've learned the water cycle. So like, at least that's something to build on, but like basically understanding where your water comes from it's not just yeah as you I really appreciate what you said Liz cuz I it's I I really do want to speak to all ages cuz I'm learning too and and this is just basic things that everyone should should know so agreed thank you thanks, thanks. also take a moment to also look at the chat um right. Christina Sunday who is from Canada said just wonderful presentation Thank you for making an amazing contribution for saving our fragile planet. Um, your work is similar in, in a way um, to both Christina, Christina Sunday and Anne Warburton's work, working with recyclable materials, you know, um, making, you know, awareness to uh, the environment, environmental issues and, you know, earth. Um, and I couldn't agree more with, um, with Liz. We need to start you know, teaching our children at a young age, just like the, the, your granddaughter hugging the tree is just yeah. amazing, right? Where their water comes from, you know, the, the harm that's really done with, uh, you know, uh, um, from plastics and our wildlife. Even I remember seeing very, very long time ago how the plastic rings around soda cans get mm. around the necks of birds. Mm. And it's something as simple as just cutting them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, and I did that with my kids and my granddaughters. It's like, what are you doing? What am I doing? You need right. to cut through because this is what happens, you yeah. know, making making them mindful at a very young age yeah. of, you know, what these simple acts can help, you know, can prevent. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
Very true. Well, thanks for the comments, everyone. I appreciate it. Anything else? Carolina, do you want to do your takeaway? Sure. Here in Artivism, we usually close the presentation, especially today also, that is the closing of the spring season. Thank you to the audience for your support, all this, um, all this, uh, through this journey. Um, the point for the takeaway is to inspire the audience to take action from what you presented today. So the question goes, what will be your key takeaway to leave us today or an action item? That's for you, Ms. Viola. Oh, wait. Okay, so the key takeaway, well, yes. I, I learn your watershed address, learn your watershed address and trace it from source to tap, like literally look it up and, and waste, where does your waste go? Like actually really understand where it goes. Cause re, we, we, re, we recycle, uh, what is it? 9% of, of what should be recycled. And that's like the, the last R of the, the R's, um, just really try to think about, do I need this? Um, less really is more. Um, we, don't, we don't need what we might think we need. And, and look around where you live, like your yard or your apartment, look at the sky, like think about what the basic systems of, of life that are, are just right in front of us. Um, and just give it a moment to, to, to think, think about how we get our basic needs met and what what has happened to allow that allow food to come to us and where did it come from and and just think in terms of systems and what what the living things under the water and that it's we're all part of it we're really like it's we need to connect to nature but we need to remember we're part of nature like there's no separation we are all like part of it. Humans are not the dominant species. We're just one. We do, we're pretty amazing, but but we're just part of it. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> and if I may chime in very quickly, be mindful of what you pour down your drain. Oh yes, totally. There are so many things and, and people are not aware. You don't, you don't dump medications. You yeah. don't dump, yeah. you know, there are so many things we should not be pouring down the drain. Right. This it just gets right back into our drinking yeah, water. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I do want to also add that um, on Sunday, May 14th, uh, we are will have our, uh, I guess, inaugural presentation out of uh, Europe. It will take place this week. It'll be the first um, on Sunday, May 14th. Um, we will have a presenter zooming in from Crete, the island of Crete in Greece, and this will kick off our European chapter to accommodate once a month for those with the time difference, um, also allowing them to speak in their own language with some English interpretation. Um, so the first one is this coming Sunday, and it's on um, Cretan macrame and the tradition of, um, um, you know, needlepoint and keeping that tradition alive. So that's this coming Sunday, and then once a month thereafter on a Sunday. And before we close for today, Ms. Viola, I was so, uh, curious, in, um, for those that are interested in studying more about eco-literacy and the topics that you have proposed today, say that I'm a student and I come across your presentation, how would I go about it? Like which topics, uh, what kind of program description is it? Could you tell us a bit more about the, that line of um, of the angle for this, please? Um, well, yeah, my uh, the, I think my last slide, like the 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 center for center for eco literacy, um, they're based in California, but they have a really nice website. Um, that's that's where it all kind of started in terms of really focusing on on um, be, becoming ecologically literate and, and they, you know, based on indigenous wisdom. So that's, that's a good place to start. Um, the post carbon Institute is another great resource. They have, um, this, uh, think resilience course that is free. 
Um, it's these little um, 10 minute um, uh, little films. It's just a guy, Richard Heinberg. He's an author. He's, he's a super smart guy, really a great speaker. And he just sits there and, and explains things in, in ways that make it make complex concepts very accessible. Um, and I really, it, it's, it's something that meant a lot to me. And so I recommend that as a start. Um, yeah. Um, thank you to Adelphi University, our sponsors, Dr. Stephanie Lake, uh, the founders of Sync for Hope, uh, Monica Yunus and Camille Zamora um, for their supporting artivism and um, the uh, Artivist Award every season. Um, to Jennifer Govan of uh, Gottesman Libraries Teachers College, Columbia University. Um, thank you, everyone. Be well. Have a beautiful summer. And if we don't see you on the EU side, we'll hopefully we'll see you in the fall. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. And we hope to bye -bye. see you. you come back. Give us a workshop on how to. <laughs> bye. bye, Karen. Bye, Liz. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Viola. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.